Amazon checks into a hotel and is asked, would you like any help with your baggage? His response is, no thanks, I'm traveling light. Boom. Hey guys, welcome back to The Stimulus. I'm Steph Evans, and here's what happened this week in STEM. Since it's World Turtle and Tortoise Day, which I didn't know until this morning, thanks Twitter, the more you know, I think it's fairly appropriate that our first story of the week deals with a cyborg turtle. This week, a loggerhead sea turtle in Turkey got a brand new lease on life thanks to 3D printing. This is a cut three. You know they got creative on the naming when they added a hyphen and a number. After being struck by a boat propeller that destroyed most of his jaw, a cut three was taken in by the Decamer Sea Turtle Rescue in Turkey. Since his jaw was so badly damaged, he had to be hand fed, and his odds of returning to the wild weren't looking good. Until B Tech Innovation, a Turkish R&D company, stepped in and decided to lend a helping hand. Er, jaw. Using CT scans, B Tech was able to 3D print a custom titanium jaw and beak, which was then surgically attached. Currently, a cut 3 is doing really well, but he's still got a lot of rehab to do before he can be released into the wild. This isn't the first time something like this has happened. In fact, fairly recently, a tortoise was the recipient of a 3D printed shell. I really, really hope that 3D printing can find other applications in veterinary practices, but I do have one big gripe with this story. Really, B Tech? You felt the need to put your logo on the turtle's face? I mean, I get it. I am all for free advertising, but how does this help you in the long run? What's he gonna do? Tell all his turtle friends? Oh my gosh, I wonder how that conversation would go. Dude, sweet new beak. Where'd you get it? Thanks for asking, bro. I totally got it at B Tech Innovation. Here's their logo. Totally sweet, dude. I don't really know how turtles interact with each other. I just based that off finding Nemo. Moving on to other aquatic creature news, scientists have discovered the first warm-bodied fish. For anybody that's ever touched a fish, you know they tend to be kind of cold and wet and slimy. This is because their body temperatures tend to match whatever water they're swimming in. This creates some biological limitations when a fish is swimming in cold water. Most notably, their cardiovascular endurance is impacted negatively. Now there are some exceptions, such as tuna, billfish, and some species of shark, which are able to temporarily raise their muscle temperatures while hunting. Now scientists have discovered a fish that can consistently keep its body temperature above that of the water it's swimming in. Meet the opa, or moonfish, a one meter long fish that swims at depths of about 50 meters to 200 meters where it hunts fish and squid. As you can imagine, at these deeper depths, the water tends to run a little bit cooler, typically not exceeding 10 degrees Celsius. Thanks to some really cool adaptations, the opa is able to keep its body temperature an average of 5 degrees warmer than the water that it's swimming in. How does it do this? One way is with its rippling pectoral muscles, which generate a lot of heat, and then a layer of body fat helps conserve that heat. The opa has an unusually close arrangement of veins and arteries in its gills. When an artery carrying warm blood back from the heart is grouped close to a vein that is carrying cool blood back from the extremities, the artery is able to warm up the blood in the vein. This enables the opa to keep its body temperature a little bit warmer when it's in cooler waters. So what kind of advantage does this give the opa? Since the opa has a warmer body temperature, it has better cardiovascular endurance, which makes it a relentless predator. It's able to easily overtake its prey, which slows down faster since it is impacted by the cold temperatures of the water. Now there's still a lot that scientists don't know about the opa, but they're looking forward to studying it more in the future. Moving from under the sea to Switzerland, this week the Large Hadron Collider fired back up after a two-year hiatus and $150 million worth of upgrades. Now the runs this week were just test runs to ensure that the detectors, including Atlas, CMS, and Alice, were all functioning normally, and that the equipment used to protect the machine and its detectors from stray particles was also functioning normally. Despite this just being a test run, researchers still smashed some protons together at record-breaking speeds. In previous runs, researchers had smashed beams of protons together at about 7 or 8 tera electron volts. Now to give you a little bit of perspective, one tera electron volt is about equivalent to the energy of motion used for a mosquito when it's flying. Now while this may not seem like a lot right now, consider the scale at which this is happening. This energy is being crammed into something millions and millions of times smaller than a mosquito, on a particle level. Now going back to the tests that are being run today, researchers cranked it up to 13 tera electron volts. Again, considering the scale, this is a huge deal. So what kind of speeds are we talking here? Eh, nothing too significant, just a little bit slower than the speed of light. So far, everything's running pretty smoothly, and data collection is scheduled to start in June. I'm sure there will be many naysayers, though, talking about how this is the apocalypse and the end of days because we're playing God and it could open up a singularity. 
But for the record, my end of days looks very different in my mind, and it's actually kind of happening over in Australia right now. Arachnophobes like myself can now officially mark Southern Australia down as a place to never visit. Do you see this? It is not snow or cotton candy. Oh no, the Australians call it angel hair, but it is not pasta or actual angel hair. It is spider webs. Millions and millions of spider webs. <sighs> oh, and uh, how did it get there? I don't know. By millions of spiders raining their eight-legged hell down from the skies. I'm gonna need a minute. <laughs> There's a reason I didn't do biology. I don't do arachnids. Oh, and apparently this happens pretty regularly, like May and August in Australia. Scientists aren't totally sure what causes this, but they believe it's tied to heavy rainfall and flooding. When it's time to evacuate, the spiders climb to the highest point that they can find, throw some silk to the wind, and sail off into the sunset like Charlotte's babies. This time I'm gonna bet no pigs were crying though. Scientists call this ballooning, but to me it sounds a lot more like parasailing, except without a boat and the copious amounts of alcohol needed to get me to parasail, and the drunk friends going, yeah, do it! So, not like parasailing at all, I guess. The spiders travel in hordes of millions and millions of spiders, mainly because there's safety in numbers, and because they anticipate most of them getting picked off by predators in inclement weather. Not many have to survive, though, just enough to start their little creepy crawly colony elsewhere in whatever place they end up in. But at least this takes place in Australia, so I can, you know, completely avoid it and never actually have to go there. Say, say what? Oh, it, it takes place in Great Britain and, and, and the United States, as in, as in, here, this, this country. Yeah, okay, okay, I, I'm never going outside again, yeah. So the question of the day is, what is the worst possible thing that you can think of to come raining down on you when you're outside enjoying a lovely spring day? Let me know in the comments box down below. Also, if you're really into science -y stuff and you want to see more videos like this, feel free to give this video a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. I'm putting out videos every Saturday to talk about all the really awesome STEM news that happen throughout the week. If you want to check out the stories that I covered a little bit more in depth, I will include links to my sources down below along with links to all of my social media if you want to check me out on any other platform. If you find any really cool STEM news stories throughout the week, send them to me on Twitter at at StephFabs43 using the hashtag twistum and they might just wind up in next week's episode. Since there was so much really awesome STEM news to cover this week, there will be a second nothing but space news twistum coming out tomorrow, so stay tuned for that. But that's all I have for this video, guys, so go forth, have a wonderful Saturday, and I will see you tomorrow. After being struck by a boat prep, Prepare, prepare. Since his jaw was so badly damaged, he had to be hand fed, and his jaw was bleh, 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 bleh. This creates some biological limitations when a fish is swimming in cold water. Water, water, water. Oh. Now scientists have to dis. Now scientists have to. Now. Uh -huh. Not a good sentence. And uh, you know, how did it get there? Oh, I don't know. By eight. Friends, researchers smashed beams of protons, beams of protons, beams, not beams. Jason, stop texting me, I'm filming. I call this ballooning, but it sounds a more, a lot more, a lot more, say the sentence. Oh. <laughs> I'm an idiot. Oh.